Hi guys, and what I want to talk about in this screencast is, is energy use in a cell, and particularly with a focus on the ADP ATP cycle, which is going to be very, very useful to you as we move into our study of cellular respiration and photosynthesis and other biochemical processes like that. This molecule, this beautiful molecule that you see here in front of you, is ATP, and we'll come back and look at the structure of that in just a moment. First of all, what I want to do is have a very brief talk about some words that we use to describe energy. And there are four of them, um, exergonic, endergonic, anabolic, and catabolic. Now, an, the, the Greek word exo means out, and ergon is referring to work. Um, we, we actually define energy as the ability to do work. Um, and we're not talking about schoolwork here or digging holes. We, well, I guess not necessarily talking about digging holes or schoolwork. Work means making something happen that wouldn't happen all by itself. We'll come back to that in just a moment. So exo, think of exhale or exit. Um, we've seen this already in, in, say, exocytosis, when a cell is moving materials by bulk transport out of, out of the cell. So exo means out, ergon means energy. So these, any reaction which is an exergonic reaction is, an energy, is a reaction that's going to give out energy. Um, it's a downhill reaction. Breaking a big molecule down into small molecules, say if you take a glucose and you break it in half into two pyruvate molecules, because you're breaking that big molecule down into two smaller molecules, that's going to release energy. It's exergonic. On the other hand, if you need to move something in a direction that it wouldn't normally go, like in active transport, or if you're going to take small molecules, perhaps amino acids, and join them together to make a protein, that's not going to happen spontaneously. It won't happen all by itself. It's going to require the input of energy. And that's what an endergonic reaction is. So endergonic means energy in. Okay, so some people will call these uphill reactions or energy requiring reactions, but we're going to call them endergonic. The other pair of words that I need you to know is anabolic and catabolic. Now, you've probably heard the term anabolic in reference to perhaps, you know, maybe weightlifters who take anabolic steroids to build muscle bulk. Um, so anabolic means to build up. And, and when we're talking about, you know, biochemical reactions, um, something like taking amino acids and joining them together to make a big protein, that is anabolic. Um, if you take a whole lot of monosaccharides and join them together to make a polysaccharide, that's an anabolic reaction. Okay, so anabolic means taking little things, joining them together to build a much more complex molecule. The, the opposite word to anabolic is catabolic. So a catabolic reaction is breaking something down. So if you take a big polysaccharide like starch and you break it down into glucose, that's a catabolic reaction. If you take a protein and break it down into amino acids, that's catabolic. If you take a nucleic acid, break it down into nucleotides, it's a catabolic reaction. It just so happens that all catabolic reactions are exergonic. If you break something down, it always releases energy. And all anabolic reactions, building things up, require energy, okay? And you might think, well, why do we have two sets of words then? If, if, if always catabolic reactions are exergonic and all anabolic reactions are endergonic, why have two sets of words? Well, catabolic and anabolic are talking about structure, the molecules. Endergonic and exergonic are talking about energy, whether energy is going in or out. So they are talking about slightly different things, but you need to remember that all catabolic reactions are exergonic, all anabolic reactions are endergonic. Okay, so this molecule here is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and we call it that because it has adenine in it, um, it has a ribose sugar in it, and it has three phosphates, which is where the triphosphate bit comes from. But just have a look at this molecule for a minute, because what a lot of students don't realise, until they really look at this, I mean, think about this, where have you seen adenine before? in DNA and RNA, isn't it? In, in nucleic acids, in nucleotides, we, one of the four bases is A, T, C, G in DNA. The A is adenine, and here it is. It's also the A in ATP. And also, look, in the sugar in ATP is ribose, just like in messenger RNA. And remember, if you think about a nucleic acid or a nucleotide, each nucleotide has a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen-containing base. Well, look at ATP. It has a sugar, a triphosphate, and a nitrogen-containing base because ATP is a nucleotide. Isn't that cool? Don't you think that's cool? A lot of people, I think, don't realise that. Usually we draw it, though, as a molecular model like this one 
um, up the top here, over here. And um, let's have a closer look at, at ATP like that. Now, ATP has three phosphates, of course, as we said. And of course, if you've got a big molecule like that and you break it apart, you break it down, that, that would be a catabolic reaction. And remember, all catabolic reactions are exergonic. They release energy. So if we were to break the third phosphate off this ATP, energy will be released. Not as fire, but as, as energy. Um, energy will be released, and that can be used by, by something in the cell. So just to recap quickly before we get into the business of this screencast, there's adenosine triphosphate with three phosphates, adenosine diphosphate with two phosphates, and there's also inorganic phosphate ions. Um, of course, they're inorganic now because they're no longer part of a molecule that has carbon and hydrogen bonded to each other. So we call them P little i um, because it's an inorganic phosphate. Okay, let's get to the exciting part now. All right, so over here we have a mitochondrion. And, and over here we have a ribosome. Now, what's happening at a mitochondrion? Mitochondria take in glucose and break them down, but that's an, a catabolic exergonic reaction, isn't it? Okay. A catabolic exergonic reaction is obviously giving out energy, and that energy can be used to take one of these ADPs and phosphate ions and join a phosphate on to turn it into ATP. Okay, over here at the ribosome, on the other hand, um, the ribosome, its job is to build proteins out of amino acids. It's building proteins, so that's an anabolic process. It's going to require energy. It's endergonic. Where does it get that energy from? Well, it does it by getting one of these ATPs and breaking that third phosphate off to release the energy, and that energy is then used to join amino acids together to make a protein. Pretty simple so far. So we end up with this ADP and a phosphate. And you might say, well, in that case, how does the ATP get to the ribosome? How does the ADP get to the mitochondrion? Well, this is the beautiful thing, and it's such a simple, elegant part of nature, I think it's, it's just lovely, um, is that you know, does the ATP have to be somehow ferried across, carried across through the cell to get to the ribosome? No, it doesn't. It goes to the ribosome because over here at the mitochondrion, okay, over here at the mitochondrion, there's a very high concentration of ATP. Why is there a high concentration of ATP at the mitochondrion? Because the mitochondrion is producing ATP. It's got a stockpile of it. It's been pumping out all this ATP. It's sitting there. There's a high concentration of ATP here. And you know from our study of diffusion that molecules move from a place where there's a high concentration of that molecule to a place where there's a low concentration of that molecule over here at the, um, at the ribosome. And so, so the, the ATP molecules are just going to diffuse from over here where there's a high concentration to over here where there's a low concentration of ATP. They get used in the ribosomes over here. Um, and so there's going to be a very high concentration of ADP and inorganic phosphate over here at the ribosomes because the ribosomes are making those ADPs and phosphates. So they're going to diffuse through the cell to over here where the mitochondrion is um, because the mitochondrion is using ADP and phosphate. So there's a low concentration of ADP and phosphate over there. Isn't that cool? It's just this, this beautiful elegance in it. That we, over here we have a, a, you know, an organelle, a ribosome, that's, that's carrying out an anabolic endergonic reaction. Over here we have a mitochondrion that's carrying out an exergonic catabolic reaction. And the ATP is just ferrying the energy given off by this, um, by this exergonic reaction here. It's the, ex the catabolism of glucose in the mitochondrion is used for the anabolism of, of an ATP molecule. And those ATP molecules just ferry that energy across the cell to the ribosome where the energy is needed. And then the breakdown or the catabolism of the ATP is used by the ribosome to anabolize, to synthesize a protein. It's very beautiful, isn't it?